Well, thanks for coming. Um, we're kind of at the almost at the end of NDC, so thanks for coming for a, hopefully be a fun talk. Um, my name is Jonathan Peppers. And I, I work on .NET for Android at Microsoft um, and also .NET Maui. Um, but what we're talking about today, this is not like a product. This isn't like a, a real thing that we're selling. This is like a for fun side project uh, that I've come to talk about today. Um, yeah, so NES, which stands for Nintendo Entertainment System, um, this was, you know, when I was a kid, this was like the greatest uh, thing you could have, right? You could buy it and it turned your living room into an arcade. Um, and so I, I have some great memories of this thing, but when you look at like what the specs were back then, it's, it's pretty uh, low powered compared to what we had today. You know, so a less than two megahertz processor, um, can do 52 colors and 25 of them at the same time. Um, and you know, a lot smaller you know, cartridge size compared to like you know, any file that we look at today, right? Um, and a small resolution as well. Um, so this isn't, this isn't me, but imagine that this is me, 10 years old, um, trying to earn $100 uh, to buy a Nintendo. And uh, I mowed my grandfather's yard to earn money and, and eventually got that $100. Uh, and by the time I had it, I think the Super Nintendo was coming out. So I, I, <laughs> I wasn't about to earn 300 or 400, so I, I went with the NES. Um, but my memories of the games, of course, what we remember in our head is much better than what it actually was. But the games were glorious, you know, classic first Super Mario Brothers. It's a great game. Um, really the one that probably most people remember playing on the Nintendo. Uh, and then we'll ignore Mario 2, but Mario 3, <laughs> the big feature there was Mario could now go backwards. And I mean, that's just a, a huge upgrade. Um, and of course I showed that picture of that ad from earlier, the light gun. Um, Duck Hunt, also a great game. Um, this is one of those pictures that when I see it, it's like I can hear it, right? Like the dog laughing because I missed the ducks and, and I lost, right? So. Uh, this is all, you know, great memories. Um, so let's, let's just go through, you know, quick quick overview. Uh, first of all, why would someone do this? <laughs> Run .NET on the NES. <laughs> why would someone want to do that? Um, I'll do some demos of, of the thing working. Um, we'll talk about um, a little bit of the design I chose on how this would work and and you know, what .NET developers are used to, like trying to hook into that process. Uh, I'll show Hello World, like what that would look like in C, and then now C Sharp. Um, and we'll talk about NES binary formats and things to that nature. Um, we'll also talk about converting MSIL, which is Microsoft Intermediate Language, to assembly code that could run on NES. So why would you want to do this, right? Um, you know, for me, there's some nostalgia, but also just generally, you know, there's some computing history here, like 6502 assembly um, is used on a lot of computers. I'll, I have a slide that shows the list of them, but that was one, one reason. Um, maybe you want to learn more about .NET. This is a great way to do that, is to build something like this. Um, I do think it deepened my knowledge of things like MS Build and creating templates and things like that. Um, you also learn, uh, learned a lot about MSIL and, and AOT, ahead of time compilers, uh, which we'll dig into that more. And really the main reason to do it is it's, it's kind of a nerd flex to do it. And so <laughs> that, maybe that's the main reason, but uh, that, that's why I did this. Um, so let's talk about the sizes a little bit. Um, if an NES cartridge can hold 512 kilobytes, I think that's like the max. Um, I just found a random stat that, um, that some of the top iOS apps, they're between 150 and 200 megabytes. Um, and even the app icon would just fill up one of these cartridges. So that's not the code, that's just the app icon. Um, so that's a lot uh, uh, smaller space to work with what we have today. So let's do a demo. Um, let me just... 
Stop presenting. So I'm going to go into Visual Studio for now. Um, I'm going to create a new project. Um, and so there's this little, you know, section here, project types. I don't know if any of you have this, but I have this section that says NES. Um, so I've already installed the project template. That's really all you have to do to play with this. So let's go ahead and create one. Let's call it like Hello NDC. Um, should hopefully just take a second. Um, Visual Studio is acting a bit weird, but I think we got it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what the program is, but for now, let's just hit play and let's see what happens. Which hopefully take a second or two. Um, and so this, this is launching an emulator. Um, this is an emulator called ANESE or another NES emulator. Uh, I didn't write this, but the author was happy for me to use it for um, this project. Um, you know, he's always wanting more users, so. <laughs> um, but this, what this did is it, it compiled a, a, you know, a .NET DLL and then turned it into a NES ROM and then launched the emulator and it, it popped up just like this. Um, so to kind of show that this isn't like smoke and mirrors, that it is real, um, let's change a color. So. The NES doesn't have RGB colors like we're used to. So uh, I happen to know that the number five is a, a kind of a .NET purpley color. It's maybe it's pink purple. Um, so let's change that color and then let's make this say, hello, if I can type it right, Oslo. I could have typed some lowercase letters, but, but pretty quick turnaround and you know, we got our changes on the screen. Um, of course, that's a lot quicker than what I'm used to. I work on iOS and Android things. I would have had to like take a nap right there, you know, but. <laughs> um, but it's, a, you know, these things are so small, it, it's actually, you know, pretty quick at building and running um, NES ROMs, so. So there's, the, that's Hello World. Um, I have one other sample that I'm gonna show, just to get an idea that like, other types of apps work. So, I, yeah, one note, I, I'm on Windows here and using Visual Studio, uh, but this works on Mac and in VS Code or command line. Um, but I've just got a sample here that I'm just going to run .NET run to just kind of show it. Um, here we go. So this is another sample. All, all it is is repeating the same sprite over and over and you can configure like the way sprites are rendered. You can basically tint them. Uh, and this is just kind of showing an example of tinting it a bunch of weird colors, right? So, um, so there's a couple samples. Um, let, let's actually go and kind of talk about how this works now. If we can get back to the slides. There we go. So, <laughs> simply coding, coding. So I'm gonna show some assembly on the screen. Uh, I'm by no means an expert on 6502 assembly. <laughs> so uh, if this interests you, and come talk to me afterward, I'm, I'm happy to learn more about this. Um, but let's talk about my thought process and like how to even start like working on this. Um, you know, my first thoughts are like reduce the scope. Like we don't have to build everything. <laughs> and focus on getting Hello World working. Um, so when I hit F5 there, I didn't have a debugger. I didn't have a GC. Um, I, I don't have all of .NET available to me. Um, but what we have is the ability to write in the C-sharp language and run on, on the NES. Um, so things also like classes and methods, I don't have those. Um, it's possible for methods to work, and so that might be something I'll look at in the future. Um, and because this is for fun, there's, we don't have to make this fully compatible with anything, um, so we can just kind of ignore <laughs> that part. Um, and I, I really focus on Hello World, starting with what should a, a C-sharp NES application look like, um, its APIs and, sh and shape, and you know, was that program CS have in it? 
Um, I also focus on just getting the developer workflow to work, so .NET build, .NET run, all those types of things. So the general pipeline, so one, one piece of it, the beginning of it, um, you've got some C-sharp code, which you could be in whatever IDE you like, um, and Rosalind is going to compile that to MSIL, and that part remains unchanged. So I didn't really have to do anything there, um, but we're just kind of hooking into the .NET build process that already exists. So here's a view of ILSpy. Um, so the same uh, code on the left, um, this is what it would look like if you looked at an ILSpy or some other decompiler that can show IL. Um, and so we're going to write an MS build task that opens the IL and then outputs 6502 assembly. Um, so this is a screenshot of um, 8bitworkshop.com, uh, which I'll talk about here in a minute, but uh, it has a disassembly view and this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, it's not quite as pretty as VS Code on the left, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so this process, it kind of, it, this is kind of how .NET works on almost all other platforms. Um, but one difference, so since .NET Framework 1.0, we have a just-in-time compiler. It will load the IL at runtime, right, and it converts it into machine code that can run on, on the fly on the machine that you're running on. Um, so one of the things I work on, so Mono has an AOT ahead of time compiler um, that does this work at build time. So if you've ever made a Xamarin app or now .NET 8, .NET MAUI, um, we, we have this technology today. Um, and it's kind of interesting. Um, some Apple platforms like iOS or Mac Catalyst um, it's actually not possible to run a JIT. Um, Apple has made it where you can't execute RAM, and so that's what a JIT does, right? It creates code and memory and then tries to execute it. So, um, so that, <clears throat> one second. So, lost my train of thought. <laughs> so Apple documentation will say, um, they do this for security reasons but it's also for faster startup, so this is a, a useful thing in mobile apps. So a newer thing that, um, that's come out recently is native AOT. Um, and this is a different, completely different runtime than Mono, um, but it's built for having apps where you want small footprints and you want them to launch quickly. Um, and in .NET 7, we got this for console apps. So if, you're, uh, if you have a small command line tool, this is a great thing, you should check it out. And in .NET 8, we had experimental support for this on iOS. Um, and and we, we're still working on this. More support coming in .NET 9. Uh, we might be able to remove the experimental label, but we'll see what happens there. So this is 8bitworkshop.com, um, which for me, for a way to even figure out like, how to do this at all, um, this was the main tool that I used to do this. Uh, it has a drop-down of many different old computers and emulators, uh, one of them the NES, and you can write C code in the middle and see it kind of running live in an emulator on the right. Um, and so many of the samples that I got working came from this site. Um, I'm not really affi affiliated with them, I'm just a fan, um, but it, it also has a disassembly view to see what's going on um, in the ROM image, et cetera. Uh, and you can also download the files from here and just run that on an emulator of your choice to play with the, the actual ROM. Uh, and if you had the right hardware, you could actually flash it onto a NES cartridge and, and play the game as well. So. so let's talk about what this looks like in C. Um, of course, you've got a void main method where things um, start up. Um, and it calls a method called PALCOL or palette color, and so that's just configuring the colors of the game. Um, and so the simplest way to do it is to call it four times, like we're shown here, but you can pass in an array of a bunch of numbers to configure it in one call. Um, and then VRAM address um, and the macro NT address A, <laughs> what that's doing is you can imagine it's moving down uh, two and, and left two from the corner, so it's not drawing Hello World in the exact corner, it's coming down just a little bit. Um, 
And then VRAM write, um, that's just writing hello world to the screen. And the number 13 is how long the string is. Um, and then PPU on all will turn on the screen. And then you have an infinite loop at the bottom. Now, if that loop wasn't there, um, what would happen is the um, CPU would just keep reading the program. <laughs> and so luckily, there is a, an instruction at the end of the program that says it's like break. It's like zero. Um, but imagine if that loop wasn't there. It could read uh, like random bytes from somewhere else. And who knows what could happen there. So um, and in general, a game, all of its code would be within the while loop. Um, but for this sample that's just printing something on the screen, you don't need to have code inside. Um, so what could this look like in C-sharp? Um, this is kind of where I started. Um, and and for my, in my head, I thought that you know, C-sharp developers reading C tutorials, like maybe they should call the exact same methods and it should look the same. Um, and so I, I took advantage of some C-sharp features like top-level statements. Uh, we don't need static void main. Uh, we can just have a program CS and, and put our code in there. Um, also, the, the method calls here, the, this is on a static class. And so I'm using uh, implicit global usings uh, and the new feature using static. So it just looks like I'm calling all these methods and they're there. Um, but that's actually a static method on a static class. So this was definitely a step better using C Sharp. I think that the code is slightly cleaner, like we got rid of the string length and some things like that. Um, but eventually, my thought is maybe we could come up with APIs to make it even easier, um, eventually. So my, let's talk about my thought process in kind of making this working. Um, the part that I know is the developer experience. Like my daily work, this is kind of what I work on. <laughs> these types of problems. Um, so my, my first step was to make a reference assembly in C Sharp for the API service that I want to provide. Um, so the library I'm using here uh, is a library called NESLib. And that already exists. That is a, a library for writing NES games in C. Um, and I was just going <laughs> to basically copy paste the header file. And that's the, sh the shape of the C Sharp APIs. Um, and it's not that large. It's like 44 methods. There's some constants, some, some macros, and a few, few byte arrays and things like that. And of course, you know, things like the project template, like I, that seems straightforward to me. Um, and then writing an MS build task and targets that can hook into .NET's build process to do all the work. Um, so that, for me, this was the part that I knew. And the hard part was uh, what we're going to talk about next. Uh, NES binary format, like I had no idea what these things were, really. Uh, um, and understanding like just enough to get Hello World working was kind of my initial thought. Um, and then I was going to use a library called System Reflection Metadata, which this is similar to mono.cecil. Uh, if you've ever wanted to use code that reads code, <laughs> that's, that's what you would do in .NET, use either one of these options. And, and I'll show how that works converting to 6502 assembly. And so, you know, next part I thought I would convert multiple samples. And then eventually, maybe one day, we can write Super Mario and C Sharp. I don't know if we'll get there, but we'll see. Um, so, the NES file format. So, this is what, um, if you went to some weird, sketchy website, freeroms.com, maybe some of you have, I don't know. Um, and the file you download will have a, a .NES extension or maybe a .ROM extension. Um, that file will have a header that's about 16 bytes. And then it'll have uh, potentially a trainer, which we can ignore that for a second. Um, it'll have a section of bytes called the program ROM or PRG ROM. And then a section of bytes called the character ROM, which is like um, you, we can think of it as, as image data today, but it, it's not really an image. I'll, I'll show a little, some pictures of what that looks like. Um, and then there's some other optional space that is probably not going to be used. So the trainer, uh, it's interesting what that section is. Um, this is a place for development where uh, back in the day, if they were developing an NES game, they would have feature flags 
like debugging flags that would maybe put an extra thing on the screen, uh, maybe make Mario invincible so they could get to the end of the level, something like that. Uh, I tried to get a picture of, this is a way some people would hack like physical cartridges. They would add a trainer on top to be able to uh, change the game. I couldn't find a picture of it, um, but in today's world, people, they actually would just edit the ROM to do the same thing. So, um, so this is a picture of a random uh, ROM hack where they've changed Mario into Luigi. Um, I, I, it's, it changed some text. I think they changed the title screen and some other things, um, but that's just a fun example. So here's what it looks like if you take a cartridge apart. It's just basically one card. And you can see actually the pins where the, the program ROM and the CHR ROM, that's actually where the bytes can be written on these things. So when, when you're out of space, you're really out of space because you can only fit what's on the card <laughs> in your programs. Um, so the header, yeah, it's funny. It has the, the letters NES followed by an end of file byte. Uh, and then it has a couple um, bits for um, the size of the program ROM and the character ROM. And then the rest, you, we can really just think of them as zeros for now. So how would you write the header? Um, this, in this example here, imagine the writer is a system IO binary writer. And so you could just, just as you would thought, you could write NES, the end of file character, and then some numbers um, to fill out the, the, the header information. And so for me, the, the step one, I wrote a unit test that called code like this, and then I compared a real ROM with what I wrote, and I got the same number, and I was like, that's great. Let's <laughs> making progress. Um, so I, I showed uh, a little bit of, the, that was the header, this is the character ROM. And what's interesting about it, it's, it's kind of an image, but not really. Like, it doesn't have color information because you can tint um, all of these pictures. We could think of it as a picture. Any color you like with, with code. Uh, and so I, this is me opening the same file in two different editors, and one chose to show black and white, and one chose the, the funny rainbow colors. But, um, but you get the idea. Um, so they have the, basically the first half is, is every ASCII character so that you can put text on the screen. And then the bottom half, that's what you have left to work with as far as like putting images in your game. Um, and so a funny example of this is if you've played Super Mario 1, um, they have those green bushes that are in the, you know, the very first level. Well, if you turn the bush upside down and tint it white, all of a sudden it's a cloud, right? So they, they did plenty of tricks like that back then. Um, to make the space fit <laughs> within their games. Um, so this is a table, don't worry too much about reading it, but this is just a table of every 6502 instruction. Um, talk a little bit more about that in a second, but the thing to show here is just there's not that many on the table. Like if you looked at how many instructions are in MSIL, it's like way more than this, right? Um, and so people, you know, back then would actually write programs using just this. Um, I chose C because it was closer to C sharp uh, and it seemed more approachable as well. So, um, but here's a list of computers that, um, you know, use 6502 assembly, like the Apple One, Apple Two, Commodore machines. Um, I, I was either slightly too young or maybe we just didn't have one of these. <laughs> I, so uh, for me, learning about this was, is kind of a, a way to go back in time and, and have one of these computers. <laughs> yeah, so um, so let, let's talk about um, what it would be like to actually write more of, the, of, the, uh, of an NES ROM. So imagine now our writer so this, this is um, pseudocode, by the way. So imagine this writer is a new class that's an NES writer, and it, it has subclass binary writer. And so we could write the header. We know how to do that. Um, so in my head now, like, how, what, what would we do to replace just the text? So that, hel that string, hello world. Um, so for me, I took the ROM, and I took like a section of bytes and just saved it somewhere. Um, these are bytes of stuff that I don't know what it is yet. I'll just save it for later. Um, so then we would have the one method call, vram write 
and have hello world or whatever the string is. And then we'd have another segment of bytes that I would wait for later. <laughs> and then the, the entire string table, um, which is at the end of the ROM, followed by more unknown bytes. Um, so for me, if I got this part working, right, this would, would be a place that I could change the text, run the game, see it working, and, and inspire me to keep going, right? <laughs> Um, so let's talk about how this would work on the IL side. Um, when you compile a class library or, or whatever, um, I, this is a view of IL spy opening the compiled uh, .NET assembly. Uh, and so you can view all the code in here. That's what most people would use it for. Uh, but there's also a, a section of tables. And so, for example, the user string table, it has any inline strings that you use within your C-sharp code. Um, and there's also a string table. So there's user string and string. Um, but string is, has type names and method names, um, whereas the user string table has any like inline stuff in your code. Um, so you can imagine we could loop over the user string table and just write out the string table um, that the NES would understand. So here's what that code would look like. Uh, uh, using system reflection metadata, um, which this, is a, this library is newer than Mono Cecil, and it, it was kind of built for performance. Uh, so in this example here, the handle is actually a struct, and that's why we have this strange not handle is, is nil thing, because uh, structs can't be null. Um, but it doesn't actually allocate until you call read or get user string and actually get the string value out. Um, and so to write this in a way that NES understands, you just have to write it as ASCII, and then put a, a, a zero between each string. And that's really all you have to do as long as it's in the correct location within the ROM file. Um, so then how, what does the method call look like? Um, when we think of a C-sharp method call, we think of it as maybe one line of code. But that actually could be multiple instructions when you look at the IL. So for each parameter, there'll be uh, an instruction that puts it like on the stack. And then there'll be an instruction to call the method. So in this example, um, those IL numbers, that's just the offset in the IL. You could probably ignore that. Um, but load string is the instruction. And the load string has one operand, hello.net, which is the actual string. Um, and then the second call, void, is actually the, the, a pointer to look up the specific method and call it. So what would this look like on the NES side? Um, it's similar, like if you, if you close one eye, maybe it's similar. <laughs> um, but you could think of this instead of a stack, um, you're pushing data into different registers. Like they don't have, it's not the same type of machine. Um, but so JSR, that is jump to subroutine and return. And so push AX is like an internal subroutine to NESLib. Um, so they're basically taking a few numbers, stashing them away. And then at the end, calling jump to subroutine to VRAM write as the method call. And it knows how to look up the values from what's in the registers. Um, so it's very similar to IL. When you, when you look at it, um, you could see where it would be possible to, to make this work. Um, so let's look at what it'll look like. We, we look at our NES writer from before. Uh, in this example, I've, I've taken, I've made a new write method. and a, enum for every instruction, and then you can pass in bytes um, to follow each instruction, right? Um, so just like in, I have a code comment here that is, that was the assembly code, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so then we get to the ones that are like jump to subroutine and return. Those actually are two bytes. Um, and so in this example, you can see the bytes are flipped around. Um, because uh, the NES is a big Indian machine, which is similar to al almost all modern machines today as well. Um, but the larger bytes in a number are written first. And that's big, the big end is written first. That's why it's called that. Um, so th that's straightforward. Like, to me, it, it looks very close. Like, this is C sharp code to write assembly, but it looks very close to what the original assembly code looked like. So let's talk about a little MS Build now. Does anyone, anyone like MS Build? Anyone know about MS Build? No? Yeah. 
And this build to me is like, it's like defense against the dark arts for .NET developers, right? Like it's like, um, if you know a little MS build and you can read some logs, you can save the day and figure out why your build is broken, right? So, <laughs> uh, but I'll talk a, a little bit about, you know, how, how you can hook into .NET's build system. So MS build has targets, which are written in XML, and then it has tasks, which you would write in C Sharp. Um, so this is an example of a target that I named transpile, um, and it has inputs and outputs. So the, the input would be the .NET assembly, uh, which I used a property with the dollar sign called target path, but we can ignore the names, but it's, it's taken the input as the assembly and the output um, is a file named .NES. Um, and the inputs and outputs, what that does is if, if the input is newer than an output, then it would run this target again. So that, that's a feature for making your builds incremental. Um, and then it calls the transpile to NES task, uh, which actually does the real work. Um, and, and so if we look at what the task looks like, um, MS build task APIs have been around a while since like maybe first .NET framework. Um, so they're not async, uh, but you basically subclass a class named task which predates the system threading task. Um, any properties you add here, you can be, can be passed in from a target. So in the example before, we had like three properties. So those would be listed in C Sharp as plain properties. And you just override an execute method where you can do whatever you need to do inside. Um, and then you return true or false if you want the build to abort. Uh, in the after the execute method is complete. And so returning, if there were any errors, is kind of just the general way to write one of these. Uh, and so the, the part of launching the emulator is, this is even simpler than writing tasks. You basically just set a few properties. Uh, you can set a property run command, run arguments, run working directory. And when you run .NET run, it will evaluate your project find all these values, and then run the correct executable when you, when you type .NET run. Um, and Visual Studio also knows how to evaluate and do you know, basically the exact same thing, and so that's why my demo worked at all in Visual Studio. Um, they, they follow the same patterns on the command line as well. So here, here's one other example. This, that attribute table from before, um, the, all those diamonds of different colors, actually had some interesting things in it that I thought I would show. Um, and this is more interesting on the IL side, actually. Uh, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. So in the sample, it creates a byte array with a bunch of numbers um, that, that declares how the colors of those diamonds appear. And then sometime later, it calls VRAM write and just you know, passes in that attribute table. So this code looks straightforward to us. But when I, when I learned what, how this is represented in IL, I was quite, actually quite surprised what, what it looks like. Um, so if you, if you look at IL spy, what that instruction looks like, it has a very strange uh, class names and, and field names. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, so low token field, and it calls this class with private implementation details, and then there's this big long hash. That was very strange, right? Um, and then sometime later, it looked normal. Like, it would put that value in a local and then later call uh, VRAM write as you expect using the local. Um, but if, when I was implementing this, I'm like, wait, where is the numbers? I need those, like before, the numbers were like a bunch of zeros, 55 AA, right? <laughs> that, that, that data isn't here. Um, so I went uh, hunting in IL spy. Um, and you can't actually, f that private implementation details class, you can't find it in C-sharp view, you have to turn it into IL view. And then you can go and you find this magic type named this, and you can look inside and there's the actual data <laughs> inside. Um, so, so to make this work, I had to loop over that class um, and use the, the word private implementation details, but, um, but I was able to like save a, a a, a lookup table to be able to find the actual data as, uh, as iterating through a real program. So. so let's talk about the next steps. So at this point, I had a few samples working. Um, 
my goal was to get rid of those weird files that I saved and ignored from before, right? Um, so how, how to do that, right? Um, NES lib, you know, it, it was open source. Um, but I could also look at the disassembly view on 8-bit workshop to see all of the methods in NES lib, what their implementation was. And so this is an example of the PAL, COL, palette color method um, used before. And it's pretty straightforward, uh, but we, you could see where instead of, um, you know, using these pre-stored bytes, I could just write this code instead, write it out. And there's only 44 methods. It didn't take that long, but um, I eventually was able to get rid of all, all of the weird uh, pre-stored bytes and, and understand the entire ROM. Um, so what's the current state of this project? Um, does it work? <laughs> How are things, right? Um, you know, I've got a few samples working, um, and it's at a point where, you know, I was motivated to talk about it. Maybe I could keep going and make this a real, you know, real thing. Uh, I, I can generate the, an entire NES binary. Um, there, it, it's funny, I had, there were four bytes that I had not figured out, right? And, I, and recently I had a contributor actually figure out what those were and send a pull request. <laughs> um, so I'm happy for anyone who's willing to do that for me. Um, but yeah, so we, no pre-stored bytes. Um, I don't think that you could quite build a real game with this. Um, you know, I've just got a few wor uh, things working. Um, so things like, like a switch statement, or maybe you have some complicated branching, like if, else, if, things. Like, if those types of things may not work, right? <laughs> only know a few of my samples work. Um, I would like for methods to work. So uh, any static method within program CS that could be a subroutine, and, and, and that could work. Um, there could be some problems with closures there, but you know, I've yet to implement it and find out what, really how hard that it would be. Um, it's also possible for structs to work. Like, we don't have a garbage collector, but you can make structs in C. In NES games, we could also likely make structs work. Um, but one day, maybe Super Mario, I don't know. Maybe not. Um, the main issue here is that uh, Super Mario Brothers is not open source, obviously. Um, but this game was actually written in assembly completely. Um, but I imagine there's probably some NES lib based game that is like Mario that could, be, could possibly work um, in, in C Sharp. And, and that's kind of my current goal is to, to get some more complicated sample like that working. Um, so we can get C Sharp Mario, right? <laughs> um, so if you want to try it out, you can, you can go to my GitHub. Um, really, you just install the project template, and then you could, just like I showed here, you could just hit F5 and play with it. Um, and, and the logo here is also a contributor. I had a terrible AI-generated logo before, but this, <laughs> this one's much better, made by a human. So, uh, and thank you, the contributor who sent that in for me. Um, but yeah, um, that's really all I have. I hope, hope you learned a little bit about the NES. Hope I got through it, right? <laughs> um, but if you know more about you know, 6502 assembly than me, you know, come, come talk to me, come to the repo, um, send pull requests. You know, I'm, I'm willing to take any help to work on this project. So um, thanks. I think that's all I have. <laughs>